Sons and Lovers by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 5, Part 1 Paul Launches into Life Morrill was rather a heedless man, careless of danger, so he had endless accidents. Now, when Mrs. Morrill heard the rattle of an empty coal-cart seized at her entry-end, she ran into the parlour to look, expecting almost to see her husband seated in the wagon, his face grey under his dirt, his body limp and sick with some hurt or other. If it were he, she would run out to help. About a year after William went to London, and just after Paul had left school, before he got work, Mrs. Morrill was upstairs and her son was painting in the kitchen. He was very clever with his brush. When there came a knock at the door. Crossly, he put down his brush to go. At the same moment his mother opened a window upstairs and looked down. A pit lad in his dirt stood on the threshold. "'Is this Walter Morrill's?' he asked. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Morrill. "'What is it?' But she had guessed already. "'Your master's got hurt,' he said. "'Hey, dear me!' she exclaimed. "'It's a wonder if he hadn't, lad. And what's he done this time?' "'I don't know for sure, but it's his leg somewhere. They're taking him to the hospital.' "'Good gracious me!' she exclaimed. "'Eh, hey, dear, what a one he is! There's not five minutes of peace I'll be hanged if there is. His thumb's nearly better, and now—' Uh, did you see him? I seed him at the bottom, and I seed him bring him up in a tub, and he were in a dead faint. But he shouted like anything when Dr. Fraser examined him in the lamp cabin, and cussed and swore, and said as he were going to be taken home. He weren't going to the hospital. The boy faltered to an end. He would want to come home so that I can have all the bother. Thank you, my lad. Eh, dear, if I'm not sick, sick and surfeited, I am. She came downstairs. Paul had mechanically resumed his painting. And it must be pretty bad if they've taken him to the hospital, she went on. But what a careless creature he is! Other men don't have all these accidents. Yes, he would want to put all the burden on me. Eh, dear, just as we were getting easy a bit at last. Put those things away. There's no time to be painting now. What time is there a train? I know I shall have to go trailing to Keston. I shall have to leave that bedroom. I can finish it, said Paul. You needn't. I shall catch the seven o'clock back, I should think. Oh, my blessed heart, the fuss and commotion he'll make. And those granite sets at Tinder Hill. He might well call them kidney pebbles. They'll jolt him almost to bits. I wonder why they can't mend them, the state they're in, and all the men as go across in that ambulance. You'd think they'd have a hospital here. The men bought the ground, and, my sirs, there'd be accidents enough to keep it going. But no, they must trail them ten miles in a slow ambulance to Nottingham. It's a crying shame. Oh, and the fuss he'll make. I know he will. I wonder who's with him. Barker, I should think. Poor beggar! He'll wish himself anywhere, rather. But he'll look after him, I know. Now there's no telling how long he'll be stuck in that hospital, and won't he hate it! But if it's only his leg, it's not so bad." All the time she was getting ready. Hurriedly taking off her bodice, she crouched at the boiler while the water ran slowly into her lading-can. "'I wish this boiler was at the bottom of the sea!' she exclaimed, wriggling the handle impatiently. She had very handsome, strong arms, rather surprising on a smallish woman. Paul cleared away, put on the kettle, and set the table. "'There isn't a train till four-twenty,' he said. "'You've time enough.' "'Oh, no, I haven't!' she cried, blinking at him over the towel as she wiped her face. "'Yes, you have. You must drink a cup of tea, at any rate.' Should I come with you to Keston? Come with me? What for, I should like to know? Now, what have I to take him? Eh, hey, dear, his clean shirt, and it is a blessing it is clean. But it had better be aired. And stockings, he won't want them. And a towel, I suppose. 
and handkerchiefs. Now what else? A comb, a knife and fork and spoon, said Paul. His father had been in the hospital before. Goodness knows what sort of state his feet were in, continued Mrs. Morel, as she combed her long brown hair, that was fine as silk, and which touched now with grey. He's very particular to wash himself to the waist, but below he thinks doesn't matter. But there, I suppose, they see plenty like it. Paul had laid the table. He cut his mother one or two pieces of very thin bread and butter. "'Here you are,' he said, putting her cup of tea in her place. "'I can't be bothered!' she exclaimed crossly. "'Well, you've got to, so there. Now it's put out already,' he insisted. So she sat down and sipped her tea, and ate a little in silence. She was thinking. In a few minutes she was gone, to walk the two and a half miles to Keston Station. All the things she was taking him she had in her bulging string-bag. Paul watched her go up the road between the hedges, a little, quick-stepping figure, and his heart ached for her, that she was thrust forward again into pain and trouble. And she, tripping so quickly in her anxiety, felt at the back of her, her son's heart waiting on her, felt him bearing what part of the burden he could, even supporting her. And when she was at the hospital, she thought, "'It will upset that lad when I tell him how bad it is. I'd better be careful.' And when she was trudging home again, she felt he was coming to share her burden. "'Is it bad?' asked Paul, as soon as she had entered the house. "'It's bad enough,' she replied. "'What?' She sighed and sat down, undoing her bonnet-strings. Her son watched her face as it was lifted, and her small, work-hardened hands fingering at the bow under her chin. "'Well,' she answered, "'it's not really dangerous, but the nurse says it's a dreadful smash. You see, a great piece of rock fell on his leg, here, and it's a compound fracture. There are pieces of bone sticking through.' "'Ah! How horrid!' exclaimed the children. And, she continued, of course he says he's going to die. It wouldn't be him if he didn't. I'm done for, my lass, he said, looking at me. Don't be so silly, I said to him. You're not going to die of a broken leg, however badly it's smashed. I shall never come out of here but in a wooden box, he groaned. Well, I said, if you want them to carry you into the garden in a wooden box, when you're better— I've no doubt they will. If we think it's good for him, said the sister. She's an awfully nice sister, but rather strict. Mrs. Morel took off her bonnet. The children waited in silence. Of course, he is bad, she continued, and he will be. It's a great shock, and he's lost a lot of blood, and of course it is a very dangerous smash. It's not at all sure that it will mend so easily. And then there's the fever and the mortification. If it took bad ways, he'd quickly be gone. But there, he's a clean-blooded man, with wonderful healing flesh, and so I see no reason why it should take bad ways. Of course, there's a wound. She was pale now with emotion and anxiety. The three children realized that it was very bad for their father, and the house was silent, anxious. "'But he always gets better,' said Paul, after a while. "'That's what I tell him,' said the mother. Everybody moved about in silence. "'And he really looked nearly done for,' she said. "'But the sister says that is the pain.' Annie took away her mother's coat and bonnet. "'And he looked at me when I came away. I said, I shall have to go now, Walter, because of the train, and the children. And he looked at me. It seems hard." Paul took up his brush again and went on painting. Arthur went outside for some coal. Annie sat looking dismal. And Mrs. Morel, in her little rocking-chair that her husband had made for her when the first baby was coming, remained motionless, brooding. She was grieved 
and bitterly sorry for the man who was hurt so much. But still, in her heart of hearts, where the love should have burned, there was a blank. Now, when all her woman's pity was roused to its full extent, when she would have slaved herself to death to nurse him and to save him, when she would have taken the pain herself if she could, somewhere far away inside her, she felt indifferent to him and to his suffering. It hurt her most of all, this failure to love him, even when he roused her strong emotions. She brooded a while. "'And there,' she said suddenly, "'when I'd got halfway to Keston, I found I'd come out in my working boots and look at them.' They were an old pair of Paul's, brown and rubbed through at the toes. "'I didn't know what to do with myself for shame.' she added. In the morning, when Annie and Arthur were at school, Mrs. Morel talked again to her son, who was helping her with her housework. "'I found Barker at the hospital. He did look bad, poor little fellow. Well, I said to him, what sort of a journey did you have with him? "'Dunna ax me, missus,' he said. "'I,' I said, "'I know what he be.' "'But it wore bad for him, Mrs. Morel. It wore that,' he said. "'I know,' I said. "'At every jolt I thought my art would have flown clean out of my mouth,' he said. "'And the scream he gives sometimes. Missus, not for a fortune would I go through with it again.' "'I can quite understand it,' I said. "'It's a nasty job, though,' he said. "'And one as will be a long while afore it's right again.' "'I'm afraid it will,' I said. "'I like Mr. Barker. I do like him. There's something so manly about him.' Paul resumed his task silently. "'And, of course,' Mrs. Morel continued, "'for a man like your father, the hospital is hard. He can't understand rules and regulations, and he won't let anybody else touch him, not if he can help it. When he smashed the muscles of his thigh, and it had to be dressed four times a day, would he let anybody but me or his mother do it? He wouldn't. So, of course, he'll suffer in there with the nurses. And I didn't like leaving him. I'm sure when I kissed him and came away, it seemed a shame. So she talked to her son, almost as if she were thinking aloud to him, and he took it in as best he could, by sharing her trouble to lighten it and in the end she shared almost everything with him without knowing. Morel had a very bad time. For a week he was in a critical condition. Then he began to mend. And then, knowing he was going to get better, the whole family sighed with relief, and proceeded to live happily. They were not badly off whilst Morel was in the hospital. There were fourteen shillings a week from the pit, ten shillings from the sick club, and five shillings from the disability fund, and then every week the buddies had something for Mrs. Morel, five or six shillings, so that she was quite well to do. And whilst Morel was progressing favourably in the hospital, the family was extraordinarily happy and peaceful. On Saturdays and Wednesdays Mrs. Morel went to Nottingham to see her husband. Then she always brought back some little thing, a small tube of paints for Paul, or some thick paper, a couple of postcards for Annie, that the whole family rejoiced over for days before the girl was allowed to send them away, or a fret-saw for Arthur, or a bit of pretty wood. She described her adventures into the big shops with joy. Soon the folk in the picture-shop knew her, and knew about Paul. The girl in the book-shop took a keen interest in her. Mrs. Morel was full of information when she got home from Nottingham. The three sat round till bedtime, listening, putting in, arguing. Then Paul often raked the fire. "'I'm the man in the house now,' he used to say to his mother, with joy. They learned how perfectly peaceful the home could be, and they almost regretted, though none of them would have owned to such callousness, that their father was soon coming back. Paul was now fourteen, and was looking for work. He was a rather small and rather finely made boy, with dark brown hair and light blue eyes. 
His face had already lost its youthful chubbiness, and was becoming somewhat like William's, rough-featured, almost rugged, and it was extraordinarily mobile. Usually he looked as if he saw things, was full of life, and warm. Then his smile, like his mother's, came suddenly and was very lovable. And then, when there was any clog in his soul's quick running, his face went stupid and ugly. He was the sort of boy that becomes a clown and a lout as soon as he is not understood, or feels himself held cheap, and again is adorable at the first touch of warmth. He suffered very much from the first contact with anything. When he was seven, the starting school had been a nightmare and a torture to him. But afterwards he liked it. And now that he felt he had to go out into life, he went through agonies of shrinking self-consciousness. He was quite a clever painter for a boy of his years, and he knew some French and German and mathematics that Mr. Heaton had taught him. But nothing he had was of any commercial value. He was not strong enough for heavy manual work, his mother said. He did not care for making things with his hands, preferred racing about, or making excursions into the country, or reading, or painting. "'What do you want to be?' his mother asked. "'Anything?' "'That is no answer,' said Mrs. Morrell. But it was, quite truthfully, the only answer he could give. His ambition, as far as this world's gear went, was quietly to earn his thirty or thirty-five shillings a week somewhere near home, and then, when his father died, have a cottage with his mother, paint, and go out as he liked, and live happily ever after. That was his program as far as doing things went. But he was proud within himself, measuring people against himself, and placing them inexorably. And he thought that perhaps he might also make a painter, the real thing, but that he left alone. Then, said his mother, you must look in the paper for the advertisements. He looked at her. It seemed to him a bitter humiliation and an anguish to go through. But he said nothing. When he got up in the morning his whole being was knotted up over this one thought. I've got to go and look for advertisements for a job. It stood in front of the morning, that thought, killing all joy and even life for him. His heart felt like a tight knot. And then, at ten o'clock, he set off. He was supposed to be a queer, quiet child. Going up the sunny street of the little town, he felt as if all the folk he met said to themselves, "'He's going to the co-op reading room to look in the papers for a place. He can't get a job. I suppose he's living on his mother.' Then he crept up the stone stairs behind the drapery shop at the co-op, and peeped in the reading room. Usually one or two men were there either old useless fellows or colliers on the club. So he entered, full of shrinking and suffering when they looked up, seated himself at the table, and pretended to scan the news. He knew they would think, What does a lad of thirteen want in a reading-room with a newspaper? And he suffered. Then he looked wistfully out of the window. Already he was a prisoner of industrialism. Large sunflowers stared over the old red wall of the garden opposite, looking in their jolly way down on the women who were hurrying with something for dinner. The valley was full of corn, brightening in the sun. Two collieries, among the fields, waved their small white plumes of steam. Far off on the hills were the woods of Annesley, dark and fascinating. Already his heart went down. He was being taken into bondage. His freedom in the beloved home valley was going now. The brewer's wagons came rolling up from Keston with enormous barrels, four aside, like beans in a burst bean-pod. The wagoner, throned aloft, rolling massively in his seat, was not so much below Paul's eye. The man's hair on his small bullet head was bleached almost white by the sun, and on his thick red arms, rocking idly on his sack apron, the white hairs glistened. His red face shone and was almost asleep with sunshine. The horses, 
handsome and brown, went on by themselves, looking by far the masters of the show. Paul wished he were stupid. I wish, he thought to himself, I was fat like him, and like a dog in the sun. I wish I was a pig in a brewer's wagoner. Then, the room being at last empty, he would hastily copy an advertisement on a scrap of paper, then another, and slip out in immense relief. His mother would scan over his copies. Yes, she said, you may try. William had written out a letter of application, couched in admirable business language, which Paul copied with variations. The boy's handwriting was execrable so that William, who did all things well, got into a fever of impatience. The elder brother was becoming quite swanky. In London he found that he could associate with men far above his bestwood friends in station. Some of the clerks in the office had studied for the law, and were more or less going through a kind of apprenticeship. William always made friends among men wherever he went, he was so jolly. Therefore he was soon visiting and staying in houses of men who, in Bestwood, would have looked down on the unapproachable bank manager, and would merely have called indifferently on the rector. So he began to fancy himself as a great gun. He was, indeed, rather surprised at the ease with which he became a gentleman. His mother was glad he seemed so pleased, and his lodging in Walthamstow was so dreary but now there seemed to come a kind of fever into the young man's letters. He was unsettled by all the change. He did not stand firm on his own feet, but seemed to spin rather giddily on the quick current of the new life. His mother was anxious for him. She could feel him losing himself. He had danced and gone to the theatre, boated on the river, been out with friends, and she knew he sat up afterwards in his cold bedroom grinding away at Latin, because he intended to get on in his office, and in the law as much as he could. He never sent his mother any money now. It was all taken, the little he had, for his own life. And she did not want any, except sometimes, when she was in a tight corner, and when ten shillings would have saved her much worry. She still dreamed of William and of what he would do, with herself behind him. Never for a minute would she admit to herself how heavy and anxious her heart was because of him. Also he talked a good deal now of a girl he had met at a dance, a handsome brunette, quite young, and a lady, after whom the men were running thick and fast. "'I wonder if you would run, my boy,' his mother wrote to him, "'unless you saw all the other men chasing her, too.' You feel safe enough and vain enough in a crowd. But take care, and see how you feel when you find yourself alone and in triumph." William resented these things, and continued the chase. He had taken the girl on the river. "'If you saw her mother, you would know how I feel. Tall and elegant, with the clearest of clear, transparent olive complexions, hair as black as jet, and such grey eyes bright, mocking, like lights on water at night. It is all very well to be a bit satirical till you see her. And she dresses as well as any woman in London. I tell you, your son doesn't half put his head up when she goes walking down Piccadilly with him." Mrs. Morel wondered, in her heart, if her son did not go walking down Piccadilly with an elegant figure in fine clothes, rather than with a woman who was near to him but she congratulated him in her doubtful fashion. And, as she stood over the washing-tub, the mother brooded over her son. She saw him saddled with an elegant and expensive wife, earning little money, dragging along and getting draggled in some small, ugly house in a suburb. But there, she told herself, I am very likely a silly, meeting trouble half-way. Nevertheless, the load of anxiety scarcely ever left her heart, lest William should do the wrong thing by himself. Presently Paul was bidden call upon Thomas Jordan, manufacturer of surgical appliances, at twenty-one, Spaniel Row, Nottingham. Mrs. Morel was all joy. 
"'There, you see!' she cried, her eyes shining. "'You've only written four letters, and the third is answered. You're lucky, my boy, as I've always said you were.' Paul looked at the picture of a wooden leg, adorned with elastic stockings and other appliances, that figured on Mr. Jordan's note-paper, and he felt alarmed. He had not known that elastic stockings existed, and he seemed to feel the business world, with its regulated system of values, and its impersonality, and he dreaded it. It seemed monstrous also that a business could be run on wooden legs. Mother and son set off together one Tuesday morning. It was August and blazing hot. Paul walked with something screwed up tight inside him. He would have suffered much physical pain rather than this unreasonable suffering at being exposed to strangers, to be accepted or rejected. Yet he chattered away with his mother. He would never have confessed to her how he suffered over these things, and she only partly guessed. She was gay, like a sweetheart. She stood in front of the ticket office at Bestwood, and Paul watched her take from her purse the money for the tickets. As he saw her hands in their old black kid gloves, getting the silver out of the worn purse, his heart contracted with pain of love of her. She was quite excited, and quite gay. He suffered, because she would talk aloud in presence of the other travellers. "'Now look at that silly cow,' she said, careering round as if it thought it was a circus. "'It's most likely a botfly,' he said, very low. "'A what?' she asked brightly and unashamed. They thought a while. He was sensible all the time of having her opposite him. Suddenly their eyes met, and she smiled to him, a rare, intimate smile, beautiful with brightness and love. Then each looked out of the window. The sixteen slow miles of railway journey passed. The mother and son walked down Station Street, feeling the excitement of lovers having an adventure together. In Carrington Street they stopped to hang over the parapet and look at the barges on the canal below. "'It's just like Venice,' he said, seeing the sunshine on the water that lay between high factory walls. "'Perhaps,' she answered, smiling. They enjoyed the shops immensely. "'Now you see that blouse,' she would say. "'Wouldn't that just suit our Annie? And for one and eleven three, isn't that cheap?' "'And made of needlework as well,' he said. "'Yes.' They had plenty of time, so they did not hurry. The town was strange and delightful to them, but the boy was tied up inside in a knot of apprehension. He dreaded the interview with Thomas Jordan. It was nearly eleven o'clock, by St. Peter's Church. They turned up a narrow street that led to the castle. It was gloomy and old-fashioned, having low dark shops and dark green house-doors with brass knockers, and yellow ochred doorsteps projecting on to the pavement. Then another old shop, whose small window looked like a cunning, half-shut eye. Mother and son went cautiously, looking everywhere for Thomas Jordan and son. It was like hunting in some wild place. They were on tiptoe of excitement. Suddenly they spied a big, dark archway, in which were names of various firms, Thomas Jordan among them. "'Here it is,' said Mrs. Morrell. "'But now where is it?' They looked round. On one side was a queer, dark cardboard factory, on the other a commercial hotel. "'It's up the entry,' said Paul. And they ventured under the archway, as into the jaws of the dragon. They emerged into a wide yard, like a well, with buildings all round. It was littered with straw and boxes and cardboard. The sunshine actually caught one crate, whose straw was streaming on to the yard like gold. But elsewhere the place was like a pit. There were several doors and two flights of steps. Straight in front, on a dirty glass door at the top of a staircase, loomed the ominous words, Thomas Jordan and Son, Surgical Appliances. Mrs. Morrell went first. Her son followed her. 
Charles I mounted his scaffold with a lighter heart than had Paul Morrill as he followed his mother up the dirty steps to the dirty door. She pushed open the door, and stood in pleased surprise. In front of her was a big warehouse, with creamy paper parcels everywhere, and clerks, with their shirt-sleeves rolled back, were going about in an at-home sort of way. The light was subdued. The glossy cream parcels seemed luminous. The counters were of dark brown wood. All was quiet and very homely. Mrs. Morrill took two steps forward, then waited. Paul stood behind her. She had on her Sunday bonnet and a black veil. He wore a boy's broad white collar and a Norfolk suit. One of the clerks looked up. He was thin and tall, with a small face. His way of looking was alert. Then he glanced round to the other end of the room, where there was a glass office. And then he came forward. He did not say anything, but leaned in a gentle, inquiring fashion towards Mrs. Morrill. "'Can I see Mr. Jordan?' she asked. "'I'll fetch him,' answered the young man. He went down to the glass office. A red-faced, white-whiskered old man looked up. He reminded Paul of a Pomeranian dog. Then the same little man came up the room. He had short legs, was rather stout, and wore an alpaca jacket. So with one ear up, as it were, he came stoutly and inquiringly down the room. "'Good morning,' he said, hesitating before Mrs. Morrill, in doubt as to whether she were a customer or not. "'Good morning. I came with my son, Paul Morrill. You asked him to call this morning.' "'Come this way,' said Mr. Jordan, in a rather snappy little manner, intended to be businesslike. They followed the manufacturer into a grubby little room, upholstered in black American leather, glossy with the rubbing of many customers. On the table was a pile of trusses, yellow wash-leather hoops tangled together. They looked new and living. Paul sniffed the odor of new wash-leather. He wondered what the things were. By this time he was so much stunned that he only noticed the outside things. "'Sit down.' said Mr. Jordan, irritably pointing Mrs. Morrill to a horsehair chair. She sat on the edge in an uncertain fashion. Then the little old man fidgeted and found a paper. "'Did you write this letter?' he snapped, thrusting what Paul recognized as his own note-paper in front of him. "'Yes,' he answered. At that moment he was occupied in two ways— First, in feeling guilty for telling a lie, since William had composed the letter. Second, in wondering why his letter seemed so strange and different, in the fat red hand of the man, from what it had been when it lay on the kitchen table. It was like a part of himself, gone astray. He resented the way the man held it. "'Where did you learn to write?' said the old man crossly. Paul merely looked at him shamedly, and did not answer. "'He is a bad writer,' put in Mrs. Morrill, apologetically. Then she pushed up her veil. Paul hated her for not being prouder with this common little man, and he loved her face clear of the veil. "'And you say you know French?' inquired the little man, still sharply. "'Yes,' said Paul. "'What school did you go to?' "'The board school.' "'And did you learn it there?' "'No, I—' The boy went crimson and got no farther. "'His godfather gave him lessons,' said Mrs. Morrill, half pleading and rather distant. Mr. Jordan hesitated. Then, in his irritable manner, he always seemed to keep his hands ready for action, he pulled another sheet of paper from his pocket, unfolded it. The paper made a crackling noise. He handed it to Paul. "'Read that,' he said. It was a note in French, in thin, flimsy, foreign handwriting, that the boy could not decipher. He stared blankly at the paper. "'Monsieur,' he began, then he looked in great confusion at Mr. Jordan. "'It's the—it's the—' He wanted to say handwriting, but his wits would no longer work even sufficiently to supply him with the word. Feeling an utter fool, and hating Mr. Jordan, 
he turned desperately to the paper again. "'Sir, please send me—' uh, I, I, "'I can't tell the, uh, two pairs, grifuba, grey thread stockings, uh, uh, sons, without, uh, I can't tell the words, uh, dwat, fingers, uh, I can't tell the—' He wanted to say handwriting, but the words still refused to come. Seeing him stuck, Mr. Jordan snatched the paper from him. "'Please send by return two pairs grey thread stockings without toes.' "'Well,' flashed Paul, "'Dwat means fingers as well as, as a rule.' The little man looked at him. He did not know whether Dwat meant finger. He knew that for all his purposes it meant toes. "'Fingers to stockings!' he snapped. "'Well, it does mean fingers,' the boy persisted. He hated the little man, who made such a clod of him. Mr. Jordan looked at the pale, stupid, defiant boy, then at the mother, who sat quiet and with all that peculiar shut-off look of the poor who have to depend on the favour of others. "'And when could he come?' he asked. "'Well,' said Mrs. Morrell, "'as soon as you wish. He has finished school now.' "'He would live in Bestwood?' "'Yes, but he could be in, at the station, at quarter to eight. Huh. It ended by Paul's being engaged as junior spiral clerk at eight shillings a week. The boy did not open his mouth to say another word, after having insisted that Dwat meant fingers. He followed his mother down the stairs. She looked at him with her bright blue eyes full of love and joy. "'I think you'll like it,' she said. Joie does mean fingers, mother, and it was the writing. I couldn't read the writing. Never mind, my boy. I'm sure he'll be all right, and you won't see much of him. Wasn't that first young fellow nice? I'm sure you'll like them. But wasn't Mr. Jordan common, mother? Does he own it all? I suppose he was a workman who has got on, she said. You mustn't mind people so much. They're not being disagreeable to you. It's their way. You always think people are meaning things for you, but they don't. It was very sunny. Over the big desolate space of the marketplace the blue sky shimmered, and the granite cobbles of the paving glistened. Shops down the long row were deep in obscurity, and the shadow was full of colour. Just where the horse trams trundled across the market was a row of fruit stalls, with fruit blazing in the sun, apples and piles of reddish oranges, small green-gauge plums and bananas. There was a warm scent of fruit as mother and son passed. Gradually his feeling of ignominy and of rage sank. "'Where shall we go for dinner?' asked the mother. It was felt to be a reckless extravagance. Paul had only been in an eating-house once or twice in his life, and then only to have a cup of tea and a bun. Most of the people of Bestwood considered that tea and bread and butter, and perhaps potted beef, was all they could afford to eat in Nottingham. Real cooked dinner was considered great extravagance. Paul felt rather guilty. They found a place that looked quite cheap, but when Mrs. Morrell scanned the bill of fare her heart was heavy. Things were so dear. So she ordered kidney pies and potatoes as the cheapest available dish. "'We oughtn't to have come here, mother,' said Paul. "'Never mind,' she said. "'We won't come again.' She insisted on his having a small currant tart, because he liked sweets. "'I don't want it, mother,' he pleaded. "'Yes,' she insisted. "'You'll have it.' and she looked round for the waitress, but the waitress was busy, and Mrs. Morrell did not like to bother her then. So the mother and son waited for the girl's pleasure, whilst she flirted among the men. "'Brazen hussy,' said Mrs. Morrell to Paul. "'Look now, she's taking that man his pudding, and he came long after us.' "'It doesn't matter, mother,' said Paul. 
Mrs. Morrill was angry. But she was too poor, and her orders were too meagre, so that she had not the courage to insist on her rights just then. They waited and waited. "'Should we go, mother?' he said. Then Mrs. Morrill stood up. The girl was passing near. "'Will you bring one currant tart?' said Mrs. Morrill clearly. The girl looked round insolently. "'Directly,' she said. "'We have waited quite long enough,' said Mrs. Morrill. In a moment the girl came back with the tart. Mrs. Morrill asked coldly for the bill. Paul wanted to sink through the floor. He marvelled at his mother's hardness. He knew that only years of battling had taught her to insist even so little on her rights. She shrank as much as he. "'It's the last time I go there for anything,' she declared, when they were outside the place, thankful to be clear. "'We'll go,' she said, "'and look at keeps and boots, and one or two places, shall we?' They had discussions over the pictures, and Mrs. Morrill wanted to buy him a little sable brush that he hankered after. But this indulgence he refused. He stood in front of milliner's shops and a draper's shops, almost bored, but content for her to be interested. They wandered on. "'Now just look at those black grapes,' she said. "'They make your mouth water. I've wanted some of those for years, but I shall have to wait a bit before I get them.' Then she rejoiced in the florists, standing in the doorway, sniffing. "'Oh, oh, isn't it simply lovely!' Paul saw, in the darkness of the shop, an elegant young lady in black, peering over the counter curiously. "'They're looking at you,' he said, trying to draw his mother away. "'But what is it?' she exclaimed, refusing to be moved. "'Stocks,' he answered sniffing hastily. Look, there's a tub full. So there is, red and white. But really, I never knew stocks to smell like it. And, to his great relief, she moved out of the doorway, but only to stand in front of the window. Paul! she cried to him, who was trying to get out of sight of the elegant young lady in black, the shop girl. Paul, just look here! He came reluctantly back. "'Now just look at that fuchsia!' she exclaimed, pointing. "'Hm!' He made a curious, interested sound. "'You'd think every second as the flowers were going to fall off, they hang so big and heavy.' "'And such an abundance!' she cried. "'And the way they drop downwards with their threads and knots!' "'Yes!' she exclaimed. "'Lovely!' "'I wonder who'll buy it,' he said. I wonder," she answered. Not us. It would die in our parlor. Yes, beastly cold, sunless hole. It kills every bit of a plant you put in, and the kitchen chokes them to death. They bought a few things and set off towards the station. Looking up the canal, through the dark pass of the buildings, they saw the castle on its bluff of brown, green-bushed rock, in a positive miracle of delicate sunshine. "'Won't it be nice for me to come out at dinner-times?' said Paul. "'I can go all round here and see everything. I shall love it.' "'You will,' assented his mother. He had spent a perfect afternoon with his mother. They arrived home in the mellow evening, happy and glowing and tired. End of Part 1 of chapter 5.